What's up, everybody? This is your girl Erica from the Classy Climb blog coming in here on a Saturday. Then got certain burnt outside. So we're going to do this quickly so I can head to the house and rub some aloe on my arms. Uh, this one is about boarding houses making a return. They never left. Credit and getting in the mix. Uh, there's something I talk about a lot on this channel about timing and just going for it and like stick taking steps and taking action. And I think a lot of times people go, well, Erica, that's easy for you to say. And I'm just letting you know, time ain't on your side like that, right? Um, today, Diamond Dave did a really great show on the recession and how come you're always being sold uh, to get less when most people out here are getting more. Now, I'll tell you this. I think part of it too is we have the movement of the soft living. Oh, Erica, I want to be living soft. And a lot of that comes from they're tired, they don't want to be doing hustle culture. <laughs> they didn't make progress. You know, maybe they they took a loss. They don't like it. And so you have this internet of, of crying and going on and on and on. And I'm going to show you how boarding houses never left. If you, if you went over to Europe or if you went to Ireland, UK, boarding houses have been around since the dawn of time. There's always some widow or a bunch of spinsters or a bunch of single men who didn't have somewhere, didn't have family. So they would make housing for them. This is even happening in China. China is now, China and also Japan have these places where men went to go work in another city and send home money. Well, now everybody that's back at home is, is dying off or they don't remember him or he's too old or whatever, right? And so they have these cities with men who especially in South Korea too, where they went so they went to another city town, they sent home money, and now they're older, they can't work. What do we do with those folks, right? So boarding houses aren't something new. They're just surprisingly new to us because we are in America kind of in the suburban culture. Everybody gets your own house culture, which we've never really fully done. But um, integration, you know, if you look back at the true kind of black south we had to have our own hotels our own hospitals all that other stuff right we had boarding houses they were huge and i'm gonna show you several articles on it um but part of why i want you to to hear that because because see when we took away boarding houses we now have this van life this rv living this on the road kind of thing don't worry those people will be just fine there's a video i posted on community wall about uh they call it a triangle. I forgot the name of it, but it's basically where everything, there's major cities that connect in a triangle. Now, if you're in DC, you're talking about DC, DC, Maryland. It's a weird triangle, but it's like that DC area, uh, DMV kind of area, right? Well, then you have Georgia, then you have New York, then you have California, LA, right? That's a whole triangle in itself. Texas triangle is Dallas. Um, honestly, Dallas, Austin, Houston, but really it's Dallas, San Antonio, Houston, but it's Austin now. And, and what's going to happen in those triangles is massive growth, right? Everything within the triangle of Atlanta, Georgia, maybe Augusta and something else, right? The triangle there, and in my mind, the triangle really is, weirdly enough, it's not a good triangle, but it's Charlotte, Atlanta, Nashville, Tennessee, right? <laughs> I don't have a map in front of me to do a really good demonstration like I want, but what I'm trying to get you to understand is those areas will be hot centers of growth. They'll be hot centers of growth. That's where people will live. That's will be massive conglomeration of money, wealth. That's where it's going to be. I can tell you right now, you can go watch that video on the community page. I'm going to post it again after this ends, but it'll be Texas. Texas will be this massive place where people live all in the whole state, like we still have room to go out. This is why I'm doubling down my chips in Texas. Even if I don't live here in the future, I will be doubling down my chips, my money, and my investment in this area, right? So Texas, Florida, Georgia, um, you know, DMV, DC, right? Because there's that's where the money comes from. Well, that's where we send our money, and then they just redistribute it. Now, New York and California have always been old triangles. They will still have massive sway massive influence because so many people live there but the southeast is where people will, will move themselves to right that's just is what it is now why am i bringing that up because when people start seeing these boarding houses they're coming into these cities that are already within the triangle right and part of what i want you to understand is there is things wrong with work 
the old corporate party, I shared a video from uh, Aaron Cleary, the whole corporate, I'm going to go get a corporate job and they're going to give me a corporate card and a car and I'm going to live the dream. That's happening, but very, very little, like maybe 10% of our population. That's happening for some of the Walmart executives, right, in, in, in Arkansas, right? They're having real good cash flow, six-figure jobs in Arkansas, but you're in Arkansas, right? That's the whole conundrum. You're in Arkansas. But it's beautiful, right? It's beautiful. And that's going to be rare, right? So we have all these people, and I'm using Timothy Ward as an example. I know people hate that, who are like, I just want to work a little bit. I just want to work 30 hours a week and still have the same quality of life. And that's ultimately who they're marketing to. They're marketing. They're marketing to people who, I just want to work a little bit and have a high quality of life. Uh, if you've ever gone to Nantucket or you go to Connecticut, there's some people out there they got an old Subaru. It's it's like 1999 Subaru. They got old clothes. They got old everything. They got a house though. They got a house in that region. And people think, well, maybe they're old money. No, no, no. They're just holding on in a region and fitting in because of it, right? And so when we look at people, they're championing this. Oh, I want to work less. I want to work less. Yeah, I'll, I need balance. I need to work less. And our society is getting ready with automation to get you there. Like, yeah, yeah, you're right, man. You need balance. You need to work less, right? People like me who are going to go take, you know, three months off and like 98 days, I need I need staff to do automation, Zapier, bl blogs, articles. I think I got a few interviews in between that time, but not many. They're like the people that I hired <laughs> in this Texas region, they're stay at home moms. They're like, I just need a little bit of work. I'm like, oh, no problem. I got just a little bit of work and I got just a little bit of money to pay you. This is the way we're moving. It is. This is the way we're moving ever since the pandemic. And so they're marketing to you that, you know what? American society is so tough. We're overworking everybody. It's too much work, right? They're championing. Living in boarding houses, living in group housing, they're championing it, all right? And again, don't get lost on the fact I just used Timothy name as an example. Every video, this happens, and you guys just get, you can't let it go. You're like, but, but Tim, didn't. stop, stop, let it go. It's just an example. We got plenty of Tims out there in this world. We got plenty of of cat moms out there in this world. We got plenty of dog moms, dog dads out here in this world. He's just an example. Don't get lost in the example. Okay. Don't get lost. I know this, I know it's easy to do, but don't get lost. And so what I'm trying to tell you is we're going to, we're going to change work. We're going to totally change work. Don't you worry. We're going to change it. Right. So that right off rip 20%, they're going to pull out the system. Now, what do I mean they're going to pull out the system? The people I know, they're taking their kids on long vacations. They're going overseas. They're, there's a group, there's a family right now. The father, father, mother, three of their adult kids and their spouses and their kids are over in Scotland, been there for two weeks. Now, first thing, first people are thinking, man, they're using credit card debt. They're doing all this. No, 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 no. They all own their own offices and their staff are working while they're gone and they overseas. You're going to have, and they don't, they're not an extravagant family. They don't like boast on Facebook. They don't do anything. But when you sit back and go, man, they've been over in Scotland for two weeks with three sets of grown children and their children. I wonder how much that's costing them. Right. Um, every year we do, a, <laughs> every year my family does a house, rent a house at the beach for a week, 20 bedrooms, 20 bathrooms. People are like, man, that's crazy. How do y'all all get y'all schedules synced up? I'm like, you just do. There's a 20% in our society. They're going to be off on their own schedule. Their kids are not going to be in public school. Their kids are maybe in a private school, a few of those people, but most of them they're going to be doing like hybrid teaching kids two, three hours a day, and then they're off living their life. That is coming. That's kind of already here, but now it's going to be really big, right? You used to think homeschoolers are over there doing that, but no, no, no. It's going to be bigger than you think, right? In, in North Carolina, one third of children in public school, one third in homeschool, one third is in private school. That's coming to more states. I promise you. That's coming to way more states. North Carolina has been ahead of the curve on that for a long time. 
the other 80%, I'm going to just be, I'm be honest with you. Now, 60% of them are going to be flex. Some of them are going to be in night school. Some are in private schools. But that bottom 20%, whew, the, the test scores, I remember listening to this conference online because I was sitting with somebody who was a teacher. And they were saying the test scores for the next 20 years are going to be horrible. And they're like blaming in, in, in immigration. They're blaming homes. They're blaming lack of reading. Pro, they're doing all this stuff. We spend more money than ever on schools, but for the next 20 years, they've already just said reading level scores are going to be terrible in America. Why is that? Because the kids that are the are the brightest, I'm just going to go there, kids that are in that 20%, their parents can afford to put them somewhere else, they're going to take them out. They're not going to be there. The kids in that flex movement where parents can do half home, half there, they're going to take them out too. What's going to be left at school, and I said this years ago and I know I'm right, is the kids whose parents need a babysitter. It's the kids whose parents just can't, they can't afford to do anything else or take them out. They got to just be over there. Mom, I hate school. Sorry, honey, I got to go to work. It's those kind of people. They're going to, they're going to be there. The test score is going to be horrible. When you look at the corporate dream where people want to go work at a big office and stare out a window and be on a floor with a bunch of people, there'll be 20% of people living that dream. For sure. For Sure. There'll be 20% of people still holding up these Walmarts, holding up these Targets, holding up these old conglomerates, you know, the broken parts of Sears. They'll still be holding that up. They will still be holding that up. But that 80% of flex, okay, out of that 80%, 20%, you're going to have to show up to work. You're going to have to be at the call center. You're going to have to be at the desk, right? The, the thing Timothy Ward and a few other people have been talking about lately is work's got to change. Oh, yeah, they do. They're going to change it. They're going to give you that four, four day work week, you know, that four by 10, you know, whatever, 32 hours, 35 hours, whatever gets you close. And they're going to, they're going to make you, you have to show up now. You have to be there, but they're going to change it. Don't worry. They're going to, they're going to have y'all working for real. <laughs> and so people are saying, well, they're getting ready to get rid of all these white collar jobs. All these people that you're talking about are white collar. If they really are in sales, marketing, they actually handle transactions for companies can save the bottom line. They'll be 1099 before the year is out. They'll be contracted for those companies. Let's say Bob makes 150,000 of the company. They like, we need to cut our bottom line. Let's cut some of this upper management. Bob's going to come back. Bob's going to come back. He's going to get 80K out of there and 80K out of another company doing contract work, doing technical work coming in once a month to review them, coming in twice a month or two weeks out of a month to help them get it together. I know doctors right now who have an office and they needed, they needed a break. So they hired one dude's an uh, eye doctor. He hired two more eye doctors, put them in full time. And then him, he went on vacation three weeks out of the month. And people's like, oh my God, he's so stressed. He's taking three weeks out of the month. It's just because he had that heart scare. He did. He did have a heart scare. He ain't coming back in there. He don't need to. He got two other eye doctors and, and the staff that worked the front desk working the whole eye practice. Now, sometimes he'll come in and do two weeks together in a row. But mostly he's off for three weeks and one week on. Why are the other two eye doctors there full time? They're younger. They need the money. They can't start their own practice. Same thing with the dentist I know. She she built the building, got the building there, going it. Two younger dentists that just got out of school, full of debt, working there full time, working they butt off, working they butt off. And she out at home three weeks out of the month. The, the change in work is coming, but for those who own the building, for those who own the practice, for those who know how to get the workers in, yeah, change is going to come. Now you're going to say, well, what about the other young dentists and them? What can they do? Listen, don't worry. If, they, if they're smart and they work a good five to 10 years paying their debt off and, you know, they'll either, I mean, I've seen this happen, buy the practice from the older person trying to retire fully, right? Or they'll go start their own thing. It, it ha it's a cycle. Business is cyclical. That's what y'all don't understand. So yes, work is going to change. It's definitely going to change. I went to a foot doctor when I had the, y'all know when I had the daggone uh, sea urchin in my foot from Africa. And I go over to the foot doctor office. It was a husband and wife team, but the wife didn't have a baby. And so he's like, I've been trying to let my wife stay home more so we don't have to be in here all the time. 
Well, I had to wait 45 minutes. I'm like, what is going on up in here? And he said, I'm so sorry. It's just me. They had foot patients in every office. They had one girl working the front desk. She was an older woman. She was like, oh, where'd you come from? I was like, Africa. And I showed her my phone. She's like, oh, my God. I would just love to travel. Me and my husband talk about all the time. I knew and she knew that 50-some-year-old woman did not have no money to travel. We both know it. She worked in the front desk at this place. She ain't got no money to travel. The girl that's the assistant to him is a medical student, a foot whatever medical student. And she's learning from him. So it's just those three operating that office. I know how much I pay for my foot. And I saw the other people that were in there. So I know their foot was really, really uh, costly. That's the future of work. That's the future. You're not going to have 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 people in office. No, no, you're not going to have that. You got the lady responding to emails, picking up the phone, making the calls, making sure your appointment is ready to go. You're going to have the assistant that has to be there because she needs those credits to become what you are. You the full-time doctor. And your wife taking almost a whole month off to watch y'all baby, which makes sense. Two foot doctors marry each other. Yeah, baby, let's start our own practice. On the busy days, you come in and help me. When it ain't busy, let's make this medical person do it, help us. Because she got to get the credits anyway. Them paralegals I told y'all about. I know two black attorneys in Dallas. Office full of Hispanic uh, paralegals. Now you're going to say, why they got all these Hispanic paralegals? Why don't they have black paralegals? They could. They probably could hire some. But the Hispanic paralegals are going to do what? Be advocates in their community. There's not a flood of Hispanic lawyers. I'll tell you that. What's going to happen is people in the community go, hey, Selena. <laughs> I'm just making it up. And, you know, something happened to Jorge at work. They dropped this thing. Something happened. Yada, yada. Selena's going to be like, no problem. I work at a law office. Come, come over here and hand her to take cases. That's how that's going to work. Now, that attorney, of course, rewards that paralegal. The cycle continues. The, the way work is going to be, it's going to change. This is true. We all know this is true, the way work. People that bring in money to the office will be rewarded. They will stay. They will get bonuses. People saying, hey, I need, I need Monday, Friday off. Dale, the big giant computer company here in Austin was like two years ago before COVID even happened. They were like, look, y'all got so many requests in here. We tired of the request. We're going to give everybody the option to work from home Monday and Friday. They did this in 2019 before COVID. Then COVID came. They were like, yeah, I can go home. We'll give y'all some money to put your, set your home office up. Go on out there. Go on out there. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go home. Go home. Work has already changed for, for those who have skills and those who have talent. It's already changed. For those in accounting and all these different, they don't got to work at an accounting firm no more. They could literally contract out their services. Let's say you get paid 2K each month from each company and all you're doing is their bookkeeping, get their numbers right, make sure their payroll is out. You got 10 offices you work with, you making 20K a month. And the one lady I know, she she got... <laughs> She got a cane and an old Porsche, and she would drive up to the offices, type on a computer. They have her a desk off in the back. She straightened them out for all Thursday, once a month, and the system would be paying the people to payroll, the QuickBooks. And she did that at multiple offices. If you have a skill that only takes two, three hours, right, and you saving that official business owner time, those people are already in the new economy. They already in the new economy. She out here in a cane with a Porsche, crawling up out that Porsche to get up there and go in these offices. Now, in my mind, I'd be retired, retired, but she living her life. That's what she want to do. And these offices, what? They need her. And so the future of work is changing. School will also change. Now, if you're in one of these little small towns, it's 7,000 people, it's under 40,000, it's daggone Wilson, North Carolina, where don't nobody care. Y'all gonna, gonna keep the school system running as is. You need bus drivers. You need lunch ladies. You need teachers. You know, you got the coach teaching social class and science and English and everything because you ain't got that many. It's not a big town, right? You keeping the school jig up because it's a small town. It gives jobs. Spends the money around. You can get you can give more detailed education to those kids because it's a smaller school. But when you start talking about these bigger cities, it's absolute chaos. It's absolute dysfunction. When you start seeing people saying, yeah, I'm going to pull out the system. I'm not teaching these kids. I can go home and make more money. I could be a tutor and make more money. 
I can do other stuff and make more money. They're not going to do that. They're not going to stay at school. Dallas, Texas right now, D-I-S-D is offering to pay for your teacher certification to 10,000 people. They're that short on teachers. They're like, look, we done bumped the money up. We're going to pay for your certification. Please come teach. Now, who's going to come out here and be a teacher? I'm not being disrespectful. I want you to understand this. This is not disrespect. A lot of times I meet young girls who weren't married. They were in their 20s and they needed an easy job so they could still have the summer to party and turn up. That's who's going to be your teachers. Not, not 1920s and 30s where there's some industrious young woman who can't get a job anywhere else. She can only be a nurse or a teacher. And so she's going to put all her energy into being the best teacher possible. No, those women have gone on to go make real money somewhere else. <laughs> who you have left is Jessica who got student loans and she need a job. She just need a job till she get married and she can figure out how to go home. That's who your teachers are now. <laughs> the girl who's like, you gonna pay for my certification? I can just show up. I'm gonna just read the lesson plan. Okay. Mm, okay, I can do that. I can do that. That's who you're getting for teachers. That's why you're gonna have that top 20% opt out of schools. They can opt out. They don't need to be there. They can teach better from home. Th this is just the facts. Exactly. Every teacher you knew, <laughs> there was a plan B. It was a plan B. I was in Fayetteville, North Carolina. I had eight male teachers. And people were like, how did you have so many male teachers? I said I had a bunch of retired veterans. They home, they board. What can I do in this military town? I don't want to work at Walmart. I don't want to work at a factory. Where can I work? I can work at the school. I can be a male coach. I can be a male teacher. And if the kids act crazy, I can act crazy back and tell them it's because I'm a veteran. <laughs> And I had male teachers who would act crazy on you, <laughs> like, say something, say something. You'd be sitting back there like, no, sir, I don't want to, I'm, I'm quiet. I won't say nothing. And that's how that rolls. It was a plan B. It was a retirement plan B for a lot of veteran men in military towns. I'm going to be a teacher. Yeah. I don't need the money. I got three grand coming in. I don't need a ton more money. I'm just going to come into class. Okay. Right. So again, again. We're already shaking up the school system. We're shaking up parents. There's a woman on here. They call her Aunt Karen. She's on TikTok. And she is known for roasting folks. Like she's she's doing all this investigative journalism. You know, somebody says something racist. She goes and finds their name, their home address, everything. Like she's on it. Aunt Karen. She done been in newspapers. They done talked about her. Well, guess what happened? Aunt Karen goes to kindergarten to go pick her child up from daycare. And her daughter's covered in poop. She's like, this is the eighth time my daughter's been covered in poop. This is crazy. I'm tired of this. Yada, yada, yada. I pay $1,400 a month for this daycare. And in my head, everybody's clapping. They're like, yeah, you tell those daycare workers. Yeah, Karen, you tell them. In my head, I'm like, this is the eighth time you've come and your daughter's covered in crap? Why is your daughter still at this location? Instead of investigating these races online, investigate where you can take her to the next location. Where's the next daycare? Because clearly you bring in a change of clothes, uh, her wearing uh, the, what do you call them? The, 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 what do you call the, the, um, they're not pampers. They're before the trainers, before you get to like, you know, take them pampers off. That's not working. That's not working. And that should be your number one focus and your number one goal. How do I get this kid out of this daycare? Eighth time, that's a choice. Eighth time, the second time I'd have been like, yeah, this is too much. My Pull-ups, there's the word, pull-ups. Your kid can tell somebody they got to use the bathroom. Kids wipe it, walking around, right? Out here doing whatever. And they still didn't take her to the bathroom and also change her clothes. She'd been in poop all day. No, no, Aunt Karen, no, Aunt Karen. Eight times? See, this is what I'm talking about when we have the layers of separation. Um, the second time something happened with my kid, she gone. She gone out of there. She gone out of there. Where can we put her else? Where is there another daycare? You should. Listen, when I told y'all these women were closing these daycares, two thirds of all daycares were closed in 2020 because of the pandemic. A lot of these places were not reopening. They were not reopening. They don't have to. Right? So the kinder care is so busy, they're getting 1400 for your kid, and every price is different because kids' ages. Let's say, I don't know, from what the video, what I saw, maybe 40 kids were in there. 
you you're talking about fifty thousand dollars a month and they can't figure out how to get enough workers to white butts come on now come on now <laughs> i know too many black women who had home set up daycare operations <laughs> sorry i cannot no it, this is this is where the turning point comes you're making money off TikTok, making these videos. Take that money and put your kids somewhere else or two, they need to be home with you. See, people don't want to hear that. People don't want to set it up so that their kid actually has to be home. Every day when I turn on the internet, there's somebody talking about how bad these schools are, how bad and racist these teachers are, how these teachers are treating their kids so bad. But when I ask why these kids ain't out of there, my mom was getting deployed and I got kicked out of one of the schools in North Carolina. Literally, because of a fight was coming. And I and I was like, I'm going to hit you over the head with this lunch table. <laughs> the lunch little tray. I'm not playing with you. I'm going to be violent if I got to do it. Because I wasn't a fighter. I wasn't a fighter. And so the school's like, yeah, you can't you can't be picking up stuff and hitting kids with it. You know, that's, that's crazy. Even though this girl that's trying to fight your daughter is like six feet tall in eighth grade. <laughs> and your daughter is still short. Can't be hitting people with lunch trays. So we got to put her out of school. Okay. And so my mom said, no problem. I'm going to go put her over the Christian school. The principal's hollering at my mom. No, you're not. You're going to put her in this alternative school. And that's what I say is going to happen. My mom goes, my daughter is gifted. We didn't test this child. She's going over with full scholarship to this private Christian school. What are you talking about? And so this principal just is beat red, Irish beat red, cussing, carrying on. My mom recorded the whole thing. He had to come back and apologize to her. He was notoriously known for putting black and brown children in these alternative schools. And the fact that my mom looked at him in full military uniform said, oh, no, me and my husband are going to take her right over here to this private Christian school. She's gifted. We've already tested her. She got offered to go to the North Carolina School of Science and English. Why, why are we going science and math? Why would we take her to alternative school? That's stupid. That don't make sense. He was so mad. Oh, oh you, you, you're going to take her where we tell you to take her. We're going to call CPS. She said, call him and I'm going to call my attorney. He, he didn't know what to do. He was all. Long story short, my mom went down there to the board of education. Old boy had to come back and apologize in front of a whole board of people. I was at the private Christian school learning golf and tennis. That is what it is. But see, you actually have to have a parent and parents, that father included, God rest his soul, he's, he's passed away now, that actually go, no, this is my child. I will take this child wherever I need to go. And that's what we're missing from society. Only 20% of parents are willing to be uncomfortable in their schedule to make sure this child gets where they need to be. Only 20% of society are willing to go, you know what? We're going to have to do this now. We're going to have to make a sacrifice. We're going to have to change this. Right? We're going to have to do this. This is going to have to change. We got new standards. People don't want to do that. So when I hear all this championing of low responsibility people he just he don't want to be married to have no kids Erica, you're a hater no no baby i want you to not have kids to not have not be married i want you to go live in your car i want you to go live on the side of a mountain baby i do i really do because that just frees up everybody else right that just frees everybody else up so so while i'm doing that let me go ahead and get onto the screen i was going there's 383 people here let's hit the like button um, and I just want you to understand that, like, you can hire a tutor. You can do just about anything. Okay. So again, when I talk about boarding houses, a lot of people say, Erica, what are you talking about? There are government contracts for boarding houses. There are government contracts for group homes. The future, I think every, for the next year, for the next 15 years, we'll have thousands of baby boomers retire. And I know y'all hate believing this. Because Kevin Samuel said it and got y'all believing this, that women are out here dying alone. Actually, a bunch of these group homes and these homes of assisted living are full of men. They're majority men living alone. And a caregiver comes in and out of them. And they make a ton of money. Now, there's a video, if you watch the dude from Ohio, part of the reason he bought the other guy's portfolio of houses is because they were all boarding rooms. He said, yeah, you see that house over there? It has 15 rooms in it. Now, this is one of these old Victorian houses. Huge, massive, looks like a mansion. And you're like, he's like, how many rooms are in it? He's like, 15. We've converted the whole thing into a rooming house. Y'all don't understand what's coming because it's been here forever. Now, this is a beautiful 
one this is let me make it bigger let me make it bigger can y'all see that put a one in the comments if you see it this is a beautiful one bedroom neighborhood hotel in lincoln park see it's got a little refrigerator in the corner it's got a tv a little kitchen table a little couch right there everybody seeing that see the old victorian at the top of the light fixture isn't that nice and that beautiful okay everybody see it put a one if you saw it okay so again <laughs> it's no longer a hotel now well at least half of it isn't here's why the former wrightwood hotel rooming house at 2616 north clark street is a boutique hotel but the name stuck but six out of the 14 units of the stately german renaissance building originally built to house visitors Okay, that went to go visit the World Fair Wheel, right? Has become one bedroom furnished apartments. So see, the furniture's already there, okay? Because they know how y'all are. They know y'all ain't got no furniture. They know y'all ain't saving no money. They, they already know. They already know. They said it's like an Airbnb, you know? <laughs> Indeed, these new rentals are shaping up to be a major, a major player in the city's housing market in the coming fiscal year. But no one can agree on what exactly they are. Ding, 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 okay. Developments leasing a thousand a month private bedrooms and shared apartments. In Common New Adams Building, West Side Quarters, in the West Loop, they've been tossed into squishy categories like micro, co-living, or colloquially, college dorms for adults. Okay, I didn't say that word right. It doesn't matter. All right, so meanwhile, one of the developers of the flat's latest, the Duncan has no term to classify its 260 unit apartment complex located at a former YMCA. See, why do you need YMCA when all these people aren't getting married and not having kids? You don't need a YMCA. These people ain't having kids. They want to live in a one, one bedroom furnished apartment, right? <laughs> okay, that's what they want. OK, it's a rooming house. OK, <laughs> all these people want to be digital nomads. OK, <laughs> all right. You did. You see what I'm saying? OK, so let me keep on going. Let me keep on going. Thank you. I appreciate it. That's OK. So let me keep going. Now, I don't think this can be pigeonholed, said Mark, a managing partner and chief developer officer at Cedar Street Companies. You know why? Because they're going to make a killing off this. He says, it's like we're creating our own market here. And no one likes the term boarding house, <laughs> in which tenants share common areas like dining halls, property performers provide some hospitality services. Some are even rebranding the common 19th century and 20th century living arrangements under other, other names. Why don't people like the word boarding house? Because if you go home and tell your 80-year-old grandma you live in a damn boarding house, she's like, what kind of derelict bum has this family created? What kind of failure have we created in this family that you are choosing to live in a boarding house? Because see, back, the, back when she was a young girl, boarding house were for widows. They were for spinsters. They were for uh, unfortunate women with children, orphans. They were for men who have no families and just were working in town with their lunch pail. They weren't for people who were like, I live in this, I live in this one bedroom place. That's all I got. Right? You know what I'm saying? Do you understand? Yeah, my mom had some foresight. My mama was like, I'm not playing this game with you. This guy, this principal was notoriously known for putting hundreds of kids in the Cumberland County system. Later, they took away a lot of his awards, but that's a whole nother story. His whole family left the region because, you know, they've been whooping his A. So anyway, um, what you have to understand is this is for now, if you're a young person, you say, Eric, I just left college. I got a lot of debt. I just don't want to live at my parents' house. Cool. I'm not judging you. Do what you must do. Right. Assisted living. I got it. I understand. Like we we have people in our society who who don't have family. We got it. We have people who have adult children who have disabilities and cannot live um, at home or need to live in a group home situation. I got it. I understand. I'm not. That's not. That's that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is people's stubbornness to this 
is causing this to pop up and they're going to make money off you. So now you got 260 units times $1,000. Let's go ahead and let me run my calculator. I'm hand to hand. Calculator. Now they are, and I got a couple people on my show. This is not going to just hurt the poor. This is also going to help hurt the wealthy. I'm going to show you the other person I'm thinking of. So 260 units times 1,000 is 260,000 a month. Okay, times 12 months is $3 million a year. Renting furnished one room places over a former YMCA. Now, people are saying, here go all these hedge funds and these developers should be shame of themselves making these. They need to make more affordable housing. That's what they're doing. They're making affordable housing for, John says, confirmed bachelors. Now, if you were in Chicago, you could have went around the corner to another place for 1500 and got an actual apartment. But then you'd have to be responsible. And maybe you'd have to turn around and rent the rooms out. See, people don't want to do that. That's too much work. Right? <laughs> That's what it is. The women of Brewster Place. Yeah, you remember that movie? They only rent to women. Can't have your kids. Can't be no male, extra male men there. Men there. Y'all know y'all seen this stuff. Mm-hmm. Come on now. Work is changing. Living arrangements are changing. We don't have to convince people no more. If you want to be Uncle Bobby that's never married, cool. You want to be Uncle Jody with no kids, cool. Even now, for the next 15 years, you're going to have people, boomers retiring. They are trying to figure out where to put these people, what type of housing they want to live in, all of this. There you go. I have four classmates drop $900 per person for rooms in a converted garage. It happens. It absolutely happens, okay? So let me go up here. Let me finish this. This is just one of them. Okay, so they're basically saying how, you know, housing prices are so crazy, you know? <laughs> and the word boarding house is so terrible. People hate that, right? <laughs> no one wants that on their mind, boarding house. So again, they said it makes, it gives people grimy ideals, right? It, it, again, even in the article, they say people hate the word, but that's what it is. This one person called it hobo, <laughs> hobohemian. Hobohemian, y'all, they put H-O-B-O, hemian, neighborhood. They calling y'all hobos. Mm, Jesus. Um, basically, Chicago's population went from 500,000 to 2.2 million, and housing supply simply couldn't keep up. So that's part of, they're saying, you know, this is this has happened before. It's all they're trying to say. This has happened before. Why y'all acting like this ain't new, okay? Let me go to it again. Again, here's, here's a company. This is a whole company. This is a future housing task force. They said, listen, we getting eight, we getting eight percent returns. We're getting all kind of money on these what? Boarding houses. Do you want I'm just reading this to y'all? This is not investment advice. This, I'm not telling you to invest with this company. I'm just telling you what this company is doing. Right? Because people be looking for that eight percent return on their money, right? This says, hey, this is the next generation of boarding house legislation. It's a game changer, allowing for returns of $624,000 per year based on 300 rent per week per room with 40 rooms on one lot. It's a massive return. And it provides affordable and ethical accommodation for those in need. Let me read that to y'all again, because I know I was going fast. You're going to get $624,000 a year based on $300 rent per week. So that's, what is that, y'all? That's $1,200. But because people can't save their money, they can't be responsible to pay rent on one lump sum. $300 a week per room times 40 rooms on one lot. Now, I'm not telling you to invest with these people. I'm just saying, watch this video for your, this is in Newcastle. They already know it's coming. So instead of building more single family houses, get what they're doing. They say, hey, we're just going to build this. We're just going to build this. And they have a whole bunch of, listen, this is called futurehousingtaskforce.com.au. Go look it up for yourself. Don't take my word for it. There are people in circles and groups. They call it mortgage-free homes, smarter, smaller homes, co-housing. They got money for you to invest with them. You can either buy with them or you can review their case studies, how people are getting $5,000 deposits and $90 a week rent to own homes. Think about that. $90 a week for how many years? I want you to understand what's happening. You complain you want work to change. Work is changing. So is housing. Who's going to be on the benefit side of this housing? 
you're so happy that you're paying a thousand dollars a month to live in Chicago near downtown in this housing. And the other person on the other end is making off like a fat rat, probably got a beach house, a summer house, another house. Them and their children are, are flying jets and having fancy cars. And you out here trying to smash all your stuff into a one bedroom. <laughs> Who's marketing this to you? Who's telling you, you know, you don't need no kids. You don't need no wife. All right. Sorry. So here, here's the thing. Even now, as I'm trying to close out these properties in Detroit, sorry, that's literally the property owners like, hey, somebody wants to buy it, but there's a squatter in it. Yeah, when they buy it, that day they can take it over, get the squatter out themselves, and put dogs on the door. Okay, then they can do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, this is the thing. <laughs> Again, you're, you're playing this kind of fast and loose. Oh, they won't buy it with a squatter. Yes, they will. I've seen people buy it all the time. And so, again, again, this is a game that people from other cities are trying to play. Um, hold on one second, y'all. Okay, anyways, uh, so yeah, again, this is a game we're going to play apparently in Detroit on the way out. It's like, well, no, you you put the locks on. No, you put the locks on. No, you, listen, you want the house? Buy the house. If you don't, don't do it. All right, the return of rooming houses. Again, this is easy landlord forms. Again, this is talking about how much people are making, why they're making so much money, and where essentially a lot of towns started suing rooming houses they wanted them to get out of their town right because it would it basically brought vagrants and transients to their town same thing here why property investors love boarding houses look at this exciting room y'all this is just so exciting isn't that exciting isn't that nice isn't that cool look at that you know i mean who who wouldn't want to live there you know <laughs> who who wouldn't want to Come home to that, right? So anyway, um, it talks again about what are boarding houses? Why are they making all this money? Again, they're making higher returns than regular housing because what? People, people, nature of people. Again, rooming houses could expand affordable living options. See, most people don't want to own their own home. They tell you that because that's what sounds good. Most people don't want to be a stand-up person. They just say that because that sounds good. See, they want to be like, hey, I just want to rent a room so I can live downtown and be where to party at for $500. Can I do that? No, you can't do that. Oh, man, these towns suck. There's no affordable housing. Jobs must change. This is the chant of this crowd, <laughs> okay? But don't worry. They said, don't worry. We're going to not only get you a central kitchen on each floor with food lockers like a prison. <laughs> Sorry. Units vary from 90 square feet to 160 square feet with $600, $700 a month with a $500 security deposit with three month lease becoming month to month thereafter. Why? Because they know y'all are only good for about 90 months. They know you're only good for about 90 days and then you're going to go from month to month because you don't know what you want to do. You don't know where you want to live. You're not serious about your jobs. They already bake this into the cake. See, already, somebody's already, the monkeypox, oh no. Monkeypox has been around since the 1940s. Go look it up. Actually, go research this stuff where you start just talking about it on the internet. But that's what people like to do. Oh, the monkeypox, uh, the, the, the COVID, everything, everything. Okay, cool. Go live in fear. Not over here. Uh, honey, I think it is a sleeping bag. <laughs> it's a whole nother level. Listen, this lady, this house, one of the houses... The window, two or three of the windows got broke. So you can't close it, right? 
And they're like, oh, a squatter gate. And I'm like, why would I pay him to get out? More people get in. Why would I do that? <laughs> More will get in. I'm not doing that. They can buy the house today and they can lock it up. Other than that, they can keep it moving. Let me see what else y'all had here. I missed. It's no longer conspiracy theory. None of this is. I know. Just buy a house. You own nothing to be happy. See, this is what I want. I'm trying to get y'all to the understanding of why am I reading this to y'all? Why am I putting this this way? If you get to a point where you only, and again, this is the biggest problem with um, weekly rental stays. They have people who live at the weekly rental stays who are paying $400 a week, which if you do the math, that's $1,600 a month, which is the cost of an apartment. But because they're putting every single dollar they make into the weekly stay and food and gas in their car, they never can move out of the weekly stay to a more long-term situation because they can't save money. And again, credit, it's a cycle. That's why I put that credit course out there because some of y'all, Diamond Dave, didn't even know they were attaching them to some crazy person. If you never look at your credit report, if you never block yourself off these all these secondary reporting sites, anything could be reported about you and you didn't even know it. Anything. 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 Right? So that's why we put these cars out there. That's why we put this stuff out there. There you go. Damn, my parents left my siblings and me an acre of land is just vacant. Figure out what you want to do with it. All right. Look, look, this is the thing people say. Vermont is too slow. New Hampshire is cool. I'm close to the state in Canada, but it's growing there. See, see, people got to be where the party at. Where the party at? Yeah, I need to be where the party at. <laughs> it's like, okay, cool. That's their whole focus is where the party at? Can I get closer to the party? Where the party going to be at? Is the party over there? Can I go over there? Right? Right? Again, exactly. The flu. Spanish flu. My real estate investor got me to a board. How, there you go. Yeah. 90 days. That's what. That's all they can expect out of you is 90 days of consistency. Mm -hmm. That's what they can expect. Okay, so anyways, let me go to the last one. But y'all just got to be savvy with this, right? Again, I'll do a whole video on Detroit and some of this stuff when I start go see Asia then the next week. Because literally, it's a, it's a dance and it's a game. So if I'm an investor, how do I get outside of the game of dealing with tenants that might do this or do this stuff? Make it reporting rooms. Make it boarding rooms. Again, I'm not going to pay for this. It says, long story short, they had a $10, uh, $10 million company making money off of this. Now, this is LA's last Japanese boarding house is safe for now. Elderly tenants still worried. So this is Japanese boarding house. So when you think about it, back in the day, look at him, Mr. Whoever sitting up on the porch looking happy. It says, no, I, I can't even say that last name. Hamakawan, something like that. And his neighbor, Shaboon. <laughs> These are Japanese days, y'all. I don't want to be disrespectful. Long story short, these Japanese older men live in this house. They clearly live there. Uh, he's Japanese, even though he's very tanned. This man's also Japanese, okay? So let's go on up. It says, for nearly a century, Japanese immigrants have lived in boarding houses in East Hollywood. Why? When you move to a country, you don't know anybody, you move where your people are. That is what it is, okay? So in the house heyday, they had 30 men left each day for jobs as gardeners or laborers, returning for communal meals du during which they could converse in their native language. Think about that. 30 men every day got up, came back to that house smelling like hot grass and ate communal meals. Okay, so now only seven are left. You know, that's a long time ago, right? 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, yeah. Not many of them are alive, I don't think. Shouldn't be. But anyway, now only seven are left renting Spartan rooms furnished with single bed and a small desk as they worry about their future under a new owner in a gentrifying neighborhood. So it's clearly they're doing some construction here. Um, I don't know what they're doing to it, but they're doing something to it. That is a small kitchen, even before they ripped that out. This month, Los Angeles City Council designated the house at 564 North Virgil Lane, a historical cultural monument, which is beautiful. They should because it is historically 
probably was a whole Japanese neighborhood, which would starve off but not eliminate the possibility for demolition. The owner is renovating a house, which is permitted under this new designation. He says he's offered room to tenants in the neighboring building for 400 to 500 a month they are paying. But the men, let me read that again, but the men, mostly elderly bachelors with no children, still fear being forced to move out. They would have a hard time finding the deal they have now as long-term tenants with rent control. Five hundred dollars, LA. <laughs> That's nowhere. Okay, I don't know where that would be. Um, I have nowhere to go," said Shono Yahina. I don't know. How to say he's eighty-three years old. He's a retired dishwasher and gardener who has lived in the house for three decades. As he ate his lunch with his housemates last year, I am full of anxiety and frustration every day. The reality: I have nothing. That was, wow, that depressed the shit out of me right there. Uh, the two-story clap ho- clapboard house has peeling cream colored paint, has recessed from the front porch. Which basically, it's saying it's, it's falling apart. With 23 rooms and a handful of tenants, much of it is empty. It is the last Japanese boarding house still operating in the city. According to Lindsay McKay, a member of the LA Tenants Unit and former consultant for Hollywood Heritage. Four of the other boarding houses still stand but they are no longer appanized by Japanese that's very sad um so really this is the only one with actual Japanese people in it essentially now this guy is James I can't even who was born in Hawaii but he came to 1957 and he's lived at the boarding house since 1980s he is only one of the tenants who speaks English fluently that's why they over there speaking Japanese. Where the Japanese old women at? Ain't nobody want no old man for some gardening. <laughs> Sorry, I'm done. I'm done. They said he was offered up to twenty thousand dollars to anyone who would agree to move out. Man, think about that. They were offered twenty thousand dollars to leave. Two of them could have went together and moved further way out. I don't even know where they could move for that price. I don't. LA is pretty expensive. Uh, anyway. He says he is remo- he's removed most of his historic windows as part of the renovation to allow him to rent each room for 800 This will create more affordable housing. No landlord in L.A. history offered to move tenants in a brand new unit without increasing their rent whatsoever. So he's the good guy here. Oh, look at him. So little, so little. But the ten- tenants are skeptical of the offer. Matt never explains what's the bigger intent, who 77 came to California in 1970, worked as a garter and a tour bus driver. What is his intent for this place? He's lived in this house since 1980s. Wow. That's so crazy to me. He came to, oh my God. When he first played in, he played $90 a month. $90 a month. And he's the longest standing tenant. His rent is 400 It's a safe place to live for elders, who's 83 Y'all, this is really making me real depressed. <laughs> the men didn't come to California a month. All these decades later, they don't know how, ha- don't have much. Many are retired and live off Social Security. Another dude came to America when he's 26 years old. He ended up staying, cycling through various jobs, even cooking at a sushi and tempura bar. He lost touch with his family in Japan. Oh my God, y'all. Oh my God. This is like depressing. Jesus. Gosh. Now he's in his 70s. He works as a hotel clerk in Little Tokyo. His room on the first floor holds everything he's on. A drawer full of clothes, a fan, cup, mugs, piled in a small desk. Okay, well, now that I want to go jump off a bridge. Um, 1910 and 1920s, East Hollywood, the center of Japanese life. Two people owned a farm stand and lived in Virgil. 1920, they built the boarding house next to their home. Wow. Primarily the daughter-in-law cooked three meals a day for the whole house. They organized community festivals and made tenants who many who had no family to us feel at home. The boarding house also served as an employment agency since discrimination prevented many Japanese from getting jobs on their own. During World War II, they were among the 10,000, 100,000 people of Japanese descent forced into consecration camps. After two years at the Hart Mountain Relocation Center in Wyoming, they were allowed to return home to their house. Wow. Oof. They entrusted their apartment to the Presbyterian pastor who paid their taxes for them. They actually were able to build their own lives, their old lives back. Ooh, okay. I'm uh, going to try not to cry here. This is terrible. 
Absolutely sad. He's 77. Okay. Now that I've uh, ultimately depressed y'all with that. Um, wow. Ooh. I was about to be sad here. So what is our takeaway from this? They came in the 1950s. They came in the 1970s. They came in the 1980s. They never established a family. And so now they're here. None of these men have families that they can go back to. All right? Let's let's really go there. Right? Uh, and, and honestly, you know, like, th this is awful. This is, this is awful. Those people did get checks from being in those camps. I don't know what happened to the money. That's not my, that's not, we're not counting their pockets, but I'm just saying the point of this is if you don't have a plan for your life, or you think at some point in the future, I can just jump in the mix. I can just be 50 and jump back out here and do all this stuff. I'm not saying you can't start over life at 50, 60, 70, 80 years old. I'm just reading this to you as a warning. The people who get into this mindset of, I'm going to, <clears throat> I'm going to, whew, I'm going to live real cheap and I'm going to live this minimalism life and I'm going to just save all this money. It happens to them. What happens is they just do this for years on years. Most people get into a routine and they never get out of it, right? A lot of people, when I hear people say, yeah, I'm waiting for the housing market to crash, I literally look at them and I feel so sorry for them because I know what they're telling me. Without telling me, they're telling me that I'm never going to change this pattern. I'm going to always be living in apartments, period. I already know that's what that means. I already know. I already know exactly what that means. Um, when I see people complain about schools and you ask them, why don't they move to the other side of town or they do something else for their kid and they can't tell you, I already know what that means. This is the end result of that. This is the, Hey, I'm just going to live real cheap, real low, real cheap, real low, real cheap. I'm going to just keep my head down and, and work here and there and do different stuff. I don't doubt these men were hardworking men, but to go from a Japanese boarding house of 30 men to seven are still left. What happened to other 20 men? In an area where they were in a Japanese pocket enclave, there's nobody in the community that was needing these men. Right? Nobody. So, you know. Yep, they're already building subdivisions for people. Yeah, this pretty much depressed me here. This depressed me out. This took me out. But I just want you to understand, like, I don't have a problem with people who um they did it and i read that part of the article it said they lost it but they also paid those people and this and they got to this um they got to get their house back you know what i'm saying like like somebody said this is will the black community go the way of the u.s way of the japanese something to consider right because if you think about japanese you think oh they're doing really economically well here um the second largest area of japanese is actually brazil and so, um, yeah, that's an entire culture. I mean, like, that's wow. That's wow. Look, somebody said it's sad, but nobody cares. <laughs> I'm just being honest. Like, I really want y'all to hear this stuff. You know what I mean? This is just, it is what it is. It is what it is. So again, um, somebody said, don't feel bad. They got their checks. They did get some checks. Uh, but you got to own something. You got to own something. You got to put something together. You got to have a plan because if you ask people what they plan is for you, it's not much. I don't know. I guess many of these men thought, you know, the dude who lost track of his families in Japan, if he wasn't married by a certain age, he should have went back to Japan. That's just 100. If he... If he did not have any kind of prospects of women folk in a Japan community where he lived in a Japan boarding house, he may have should have returned to Japan. That's just my thoughts. Maybe he's from a really small little town in Japan, didn't want to do that, but it's just my thoughts. Don't get mad at me. I've seen people all the time be 50, 40, 60 years old and return back to the South where their other cousins and family are from. That's, it's not, it's no dishonor in that. 
All right? Somebody said you better get in with you. You, be, you better figure something out. Somebody said I'm 48 female in DR right now, pay 300. Good living. I'm 53, retired myself, teach English online. Congratulations. That thumbnail a little while, but congratulations. Yeah. Look, being Japanese, they may live another 20 years. They may live to be 100. You don't even know. They may live that long. Um, all right. L.A. is super expensive. At some point, you have to lift your head and see what's going on around you. And this is kind of the recession talk. Most people who are, oh, my God, recession. Oh, my God, what's going on? When I see them act like that about the recession, I'm like, oh, this person's been asleep. Oh, they don't have anything set up. I, I mean, I'm going to say this, and I mean this in no disrespect. When I talk to women who are in their late 30s, going in the 40s, talking about marriage and kids, and, like, you hear them talk about, oh, I got five, ten years. I'll be looking at them like, five, ten years to do what? To do what? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> right? I even I look at men the same way I look at women. When I hear, I know this one woman who's in her 50s. Oh, yeah, I mean, I got time. I was like, got time to do what? What's the goal here? What's the game plan? I, I'm not saying everybody has to be married. Everybody has to have kids. Everybody has to have grandkids. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying if your target was always A, plan A, and plan A never worked out, you need to be telling me about plan B. That's all. Right? Again, and this is the beautiful thing about life. We can always start over tomorrow. Right? There's people who were working in corporate America, quit, doing something else. There are people I know who retired, did 20 years of post office, retired out of a cop. They doing another 20 years or something else, you know, like that's how great life is. But if these are just examples, everything that there's nothing new under sun, boarding houses are coming back just like they're going to come back. Like they're in Europe, like they're in Paris, like they're in all these other places. That's, that's all there is to this. And so when people, um, oh, <laughs> Somebody said midnight plane to Japan. Midnight plane to Japan. Like somebody would have, somebody back in Japan be like, hey, my uncle Joe, he been living in America. They'd be like, oh my God, he's from America. They would have married him off to somebody in Japan. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. I respect Dan Gilbert. How are you going to put the money? <laughs> How are you going to blame? Look, a lot of elderly Chinese men and women live alone in NYC. Yes. I think I saw something on that. Five to ten years below. <laughs> but do you get what I'm saying? Like I get I get on the phone with a lot of people and I'd be like, okay. <sighs> okay. I mean, it's a plan. As long as you're gonna uh, give it a hundred percent and work on it, like you have to understand whether it's a job, whether it's people, anything, everything has a little bit of struggle. No matter what it is, I, you can you could be with the most beautiful woman in the world. She's going to give you some kind of struggle. You could be with the most beautiful man in the world. He could be dumb. It, any of these things could happen, right? It, everything about your life is going to have a little bit of struggle. That's the beauty of life. People be so ready. I can't wait for these kids to get out of the house. Then they get out of the house. I can't wait to be retired. And then they get there. And Again, people are chasing this, I'm going to do nothing life. And that's going to create this when you're 80 years old and struggling and you can't do nothing about it. That's all, that's all I'm saying. You don't want to have a teenager age 60. There's somebody out there who who is doing that and they're just going to have to do it. Life is struggle. I know uh, a 10-year-old who has 50-something-year-old mom. He looks depressed. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Stop. Stop. Stop it. Um, but this is this all I'm trying to say is when I do these shows, I do these shows because I know where people are. They're coasting. They're riding the wave. Hey, America's not that bad. And I've been sitting here ringing the alarm for you. I said, listen, there's a video. I put it on the community wall. They had a line for trucks trying to sell their beef now. They're trying to help them get their beef processed and sold now to get that money. Get that money. And so you already know there's going to be beef shortages. You already know the processing houses are tripping. You already know. A lot of stuff is jammed up, but you're not trying to get to some farmers. You're not trying to go to the farmer markets, right? Um, be prepared, right? Because again, I keep telling y'all that 20%, they don't care. That 20%, they live in well. I mean, even the dude, there's a uh, Instagram page called American Income. Go watch them. 
They interview people off the street. The guys and girls they run into that make 180, they just chilling. They like, yeah, I make 180. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Like they, they, they. Once you get over some of the money problem, you can f- figure out your life's real problems. Right? Your mission, your purpose, your what's going on. Again, you need the three. You need daily money. You need a long-term money. And you need the big, what's the big deal we, what's the big deal we working on? Right? Okay? Because that's, that's, that's the road. Okay, that's the road. I just want y'all to understand, like, once you figure that out, you're good to go. But we are having a change, a massive change in work. We're going to have a massive change in housing. Okay? We're going to have changes coming up. Where do you want to be on that spectrum? Do you want to be eating noodles at 80 at somebody's house? And you have no control if you even get to stay there? Right? Is this is a real I mean I know a lot of people just want to go home and watch Netflix every day and chill and we need to work less and we need more work life balance in America. I'm all for that. I'm all for it, but I just want you to understand you got to make a plan. Right? So that's all I want to do. That, that was the point of this show is you know, you're gonna have change in school, you're gonna have a change in jobs, you're gonna have a change in housing, but Look at how it's going to be looking. It's, it's, Texas is going to have a big mass of people moving here next two to five years. Florida, Georgia. Georgia is going to be like the New York of the South, right? Back in the day, they wanted to put um, Disneyland halfway, right, near North Carolina, but we were dummies. So they took it to Florida. Anything can change, right? Anything can change. The, the landscape of this country can change. You're going to see more people in Florida, more people in Georgia, more people in that Huntsville, Alabama ain't going to do nothing but grow. They ain't got no choice. They're going to try to replace the population that is there with with a better population. I had this article where I was going to show y'all, but I forgot what, where, what it was. But essentially it showed all these people, all these states. I saw Fortune Magazine, Fortune.com. Go look at it. Go look at it. It talks about how all these towns are paying people ten to twenty thousand dollars in tax relief and tax benefits to move there. Tulsa, Oklahoma is one of the most ones. Why do y'all think they're doing that in Tulsa, Oklahoma? Eventually, some lawyer is gonna say y'all got to pay them descendants of them people, where y'all don't burnt that town up. I know it's one hundred twenty years later, one hundred fifty years. You got to pay them people eventually because they 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 putting too much pressure on it, too much attention got on it. There's some greedy lawyer somewhere like I'm gonna get y'all that money. I'm gonna get Tulsa, Oklahoma people that money. They could do it in Wilmington, but they ain't done it. They can do it in a lot of cities and towns. They just ain't focused it as hard as they have in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So Tulsa, Oklahoma did. Let me think about this. Let's get people 10K to move here. Kamoy moved. Several people moved to take that money. It ain't going to stop some lawyer coming by and making sure them people get that money back. But it, but they, they that's what they're doing. Vermont paying people to move there. Vermont changed the laws back in the ni- 1888. No, no, like 1910. If you were a mulatto woman or you were an octomaroon, you could marry a white man in Vermont. Why? Because they didn't have enough women. They had like one woman for every 50 to 75 men. And they wanted to get prostitution down in Vermont. They did the same thing in Oregon. They didn't want black people in Oregon. But if you was an octomaroon, you could marry. You could marry a white man and go on about your day. Because they had to do what? They had to figure out the population issue. That's all these states are going to be doing. They know people are leaving. Ohio knows you're leaving. Detroit knows you're leaving. Michigan knows you're leaving. Chicago knows you're leaving. Now it just it's just on the towns around them to figure out how do we capture some of these really smart people who don't want to move too far away from mom and daddy, but need some type of incentive. That's all I'm just telling you. There's lots of changes coming. You better figure it out. Okay. The prices of everything is rising, but real estate's supposed to crash and get cheap. Zach, this is the lie that they are convincing y'all that, hey, if you just wait, if you just sit on the sidelines, if you don't do nothing, if you just keep waiting, it'll be just fine. Don't worry, it's gonna crash. It's gonna get cheap again. When? Ask your parents, has gas ever been as cheap as 1970s? Has food ever been that cheap? Has anything gone back that cheap? Right? Ask your parents, ask your grandparents. People are really thinking that's going to happen. People are really like, oh, yeah, it's going to crash. Okay, even if it crashes, Chad, you live in a one-bedroom apartment for $1,000 a month and you have no money saved. 
What are you going to do about it? Nowhere, nothing. You don't be able to do nothing about it. Nothing about it. Nothing. So that was my information for y'all today. That's what I have for y'all. If y'all enjoyed the show, put a one in the put a one in the comments. If you enjoyed the show, hit the like button. But they're gonna squeeze this money up out of y'all. Right? They're gonna squeeze it out of y'all. They don't care if you move around, all that good stuff. They're gonna invest where the, where the, where the opportunity is. So good luck. Good luck to you out there who are paying attention. <laughs> right? Good luck. <laughs> Everybody's hoping for 2008. And I'm just, I'm looking at you like, did you not see my last couple episodes where I'm telling you Chinese, Brazilian, Colombian, every single country in the world is like, yo, America's for sale. America's for sale. Oh my God, it's for sale. We can't wait. And that's why I'm sitting here trying to get y'all to understand like, the, the, oh, it's going to crash. It's going to crash any moment now. Every one of these people in these other countries are sitting here while you're playing the game of, I'm going to wait. It's going to crash. They sitting right here, rubbing their hands together like Birdman. They know you don't want to live in apartments. They know you want to live in a house so they can buy all these community houses and you're going to rent from that house from them. They already know, right? Because you're so focused on, I need work-life balance. I need a break. They're like, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Come on through. Come on through. Yeah, come on. There you go. Todd Baldwin was a guest on BP. Purchased homes and renting out by the room. He's making a killing. They, again, people are looking for 8 to 25% returns on their money. Where else are they getting that return? They're not getting it in paper. They're not getting it in stocks. They're getting it in real estate. There was a movement maybe 20 years ago where people kept going from Minnesota and all these places and buying land in Argentina and Brazil as farmers. <laughs> And, and people don't understand, like, people are going to go keep moving around, finding ways to invest their money. That's what they're going to do, All right? So, again, you guys, this is your girl, Erica, Classic Line Blog. Thank you so much for being here. If you didn't get the credit class, definitely see you there. If you're not in Wealth Wednesdays where we're going to break down, we're going to bring in hard money lenders, wealth folks, and insurance folks. We really want to get tuned in and focused because I know what's about to happen. Folks are not focused. They're full of distractions. And... And all of a sudden, you're going to look up five years from now because that's the, the major thing of people like, well, I'm going to wait for the next crash. I'm going to wait for the next. And you're going to look up and we're going to be back in a bus, back in a boom. This happens all the time. This happens all the time. <laughs> and people are just chilling. I'm waiting on the crash. Okay, cool. Do you have any money ready for a crash? Do you have any money to buy a farm? Do you have any money to, to get access to stuff? No, you don't? Okay, cool. Cool. Good luck. So anyways, you guys, this is your girl Erica Classy Climb Blog. Later.